Welcome back to our exegetical study of First Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18. Or, as we said, really this is an illustration of how to take the five hermeneutical principles and apply them to a biblical passage. So we've already looked at the first three, the Holy Spirit element, the grammatical element, and the literary one. And so now we move on to the last two. And that means we're now looking at the historical approach. And this is where we look at a passage in its context. Every passage has a historical context. And so we need to look carefully at what that was. Another way of saying it is, what is the trouble in the text? Almost every passage of Scripture, there's some problem that the biblical writer is trying to solve or address. And so a good question for us to ask is, what is the trouble in our passage? What is the problem that Paul is trying to correct? Now, in a general way, that's easy to answer, and that is, he's trying to address the problem of grief. Grief over brothers and sisters, Christians, who have fallen asleep, that is, they have died. But then we have to go deeper than that, because we have to ask, now, why were the Christians in Thessaloniki grieving? And remember, we said so intensely. In verse 13, Paul used that uh, emphatic form of grief. You have to say, why were they so upset over brothers and sisters who have already died? And so when we go a little deeper, we find that the answer is this. As a result of Paul's preaching to the Thessalonians, they believed in not only Jesus Christ come, not only Jesus Christ living, not only Jesus Christ crucified, not only Jesus Christ resurrected, but also Jesus Christ ascended and one day coming back. And as a result, the Thessalonian Christians were very eager for the return of Jesus. But then some of the Christians in that church fell asleep. They died. And this deeply troubled the ones who were living. They worried about what would be the fate of those Christians who had already died. They worried that they might miss out completely on the parousia, the return, the second coming of Jesus, or they might be at a disadvantage compared to them who were still alive. And so in answer to that problem, Paul addresses our passage. Now let me give you some evidence that that is indeed the problem. Evidence number one is this. Paul's use of that double negative we looked at under our grammatical analysis. We refer to that as the emphatic future negation. The idea that Paul doesn't just say, we who are living will not be ahead of those who have died. He says, we will certainly, we will absolutely not. We will by no means. If I might quote Shakespeare here, we might say, you know, methinks that Paul doth protest too much. Why is he so emphatic? Well, the answer seems to be because there were some in the church who did believe that those who were living would be ahead of or in some position of advantage at Christ's return over those who had already died. Abraham Mallerby is one scholar who says, Paul's denial in 4.15, that is that, that emphatic future negation, that double negative, is so strong that it sounds like a denial of an opinion actually held by some people in Thessalonica. Evidence number two. Paul clearly sequences these eschatological or end-time events. Notice he says, oh, the deceased Christians will rise first, and then we who are living, da-da-da-da-da-da. And actually the Greek stresses the first and the end. And you have to ask yourself, why is Paul sequencing things? Why is he putting things in a chrono chronological order? Is it because he's trying to spell out those who have some confusion or questions about what will happen and when it will happen? Third evidence has to do with the addition of a little word. Actually, in Greek, it's even smaller than it is in English. In Greek, it's only three letters, hama, A-M-A. But it's the English word together. And Paul says in verse 17, not just that we will be, that is, we who are living will be with them, that is, those who have died, but he adds the word, we will be together with them. 
You don't really need the word together, right? It perfectly makes sense just saying we'll be with them. And when you add the word together, you're stressing something. You're stressing, wait a minute, that living Christians together with them, deceased Christians, will be sharing equally in uh, the glory of Jesus' return. And why is Paul stressing that? Because seemingly there are some who are doubting that or questioning that. And then the fourth piece of evidence has to do with word order. In English, uh, you know, uh, prepositional phrases belong at the end of a sentence. So it's not surprising that most English translations render this verse as, we who are alive will be caught up together with them in the clouds and so forth. Notice it's at the end of the sentence. But in Greek, the words together with them are pushed way to the front, even in front of the verb. And you do that in Greek for emphasis. So again, Paul wants to stress, it isn't just we who are alive, it's also we together with them. All of these events will happen to all Christians, not only living Christians, but also those who have already died, who have already passed away. And so the trouble in the text involves not just general grief in the face of death. Now that's a common problem, right? It's not hard to imagine that problem. People in the context of loved ones dying, they cry, they grieve, right? It's a very easy to understand and common problem faced by people today. But that doesn't seem to be the problem at work in the church of Thessaloniki. It's more precise than that. In other words, it looks like Christians there had some confusion about how all of these end time events would fit together, and especially they were worried that their fellow brothers and sisters in the Lord, who were so much looking forward to and anticipating the glory of Jesus' return, and the fact that their faith would be vindicated. We haven't said anything yet about how the church in Thessaloniki was persecuted, and how therefore they would be so eager for Christ to come back, in a sense prove to everyone around that they didn't believe in vain. And so they were worried, the Christians there, that their loved ones might miss it, that is Christ's return, or be at a disadvantage. And therefore Paul writes to them trying to comfort them over that particular trouble, that particular problem. Another kind of historical question deals with a claim that Paul makes in verse 13. It's an important claim, so we want to make sure we understand it and get it right. Paul says that, He doesn't want the readers to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. In other words, Paul is really claiming that the rest of men, that is non-Christians, have no hope in the context of death. And a good historical question is, is Paul right? Is, Is he speaking the truth? Or like some commentators today say, oh, he's just exaggerating, he's overstating the case. If we would go back in time and we would investigate what were attitudes towards death in Paul's day, what would the answer be? That's an historical kind of question. And what we find out is that Paul is indeed right. Namely, there's a clear sense of hopelessness in the context of death. For example, Theocritus is a writer of ancient Greek poetry, and he has an important saying in this regard. He says, hopes are for the living, without hope are the dead. Well, that sounds exactly what Paul is talking about, right? He says, don't grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. Theocritus says that, well, you know, the only kind of people who can have hope are the living people, right? Anybody who are dead, well, they have no hope at all. A popular grave inscription, both in Greek and Latin, throughout the ancient world went like this. I was not, and I was, I am not, I care not. That doesn't sound very optimistic or positive, right? Are you thinking about using that on your gravestone? In fact, this was so popular that it was often just abbreviated. We found many gravestones that simply had N-F-F-N-S-N-C. And the reason is that they, people could just assume, oh, I know what it means. It means non fui, fui, non sum, non curo. In other words, I was not, and I was, I am not, and I care not. So that sounds like a widespread hopelessness in the context of death. Here's another example uh, from P. oxy. In other words, Papyrus oxyrhynchus. Oxyrhynchus is a place in Egypt where a lot of papyri, due to the dry 
climate of that part of the world have survived. And this is a letter of consolation. It's written by a woman, Irene, to a husband and wife whose child has just died. So that's the context. And the first part of the letter, she says things like, I and my family have done the kind of customary duties that one does in this situation to show that we sympathize with you in your loss, in your trouble. But then she closes her letter well, with this line in which she tries to be comforting. She says, but nevertheless, one is able to do nothing against such things, namely the death of your son. Therefore, comfort yourselves. Now think about the logic of what she is saying. She's saying, well, you know, you couldn't have done anything to prevent the death of your son, so comfort yourself in your helplessness, right? In your inability to do anything to change your situation. Well, it doesn't sound very hopeful or comforting to me, does it to you? Seneca was a very famous, not only politician, statesman, but also philosopher, closely connected with the emperor Nero. Anyway, he referred to the mystery religions. I don't know if you know much about the mystery religions. Actually, we don't know a lot about them because they were so mysterious. But in addition to all the Greek and Roman and Egyptian cults, there were these mystery religions. And they were a bit unusual in the sense that they promised some kind of life after death. They were a bit different than the other kind of religions or cults of that day. But notice how he refers to them. He refers to them as, quote, human pipe dreams. It's almost as if he were saying in a colloquial fashion, what are you guys smoking, right? That can't be true. Who would believe in some kind of life after death existence like that? Now, even without the kind of historical evidence that we've just looked at so far, Paul has also a theological reason for claiming that non-Christians don't have hope in the context of death. And that's because Paul believes that non-Christians are, and, and I'm quoting here from his words to the Ephesians, a different Christian church, he says that non-Christians are, quote, without God in the world, and because they're without God in the world, they are therefore those who have no hope. But the wonderful contrast in our passage is that Christians in Thessaloniki are different from the rest of men. The rest of men grieve without hope, but Paul, as we're going to see in this passage, he says we do have hope. Hope not only for our deceased loved ones who have died before Jesus comes again, but also hope for us who are still alive on that great and glorious day. Well, uh, let's turn to one more uh, kind of historical question, and that has to do with Paul's reference in verses 15, 16, and 17 to the word of the Lord. He says, for this we say to you by the word of the Lord, verse 15. Now, Paul has received some revelation from the Lord, and for Paul, the Lord is never God the Father or the Holy Spirit. It's always the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Paul has received some kind of teaching, some kind of truth, some kind of revelation from Jesus, and that raises three questions, or at least I think it should. Question one is, where did Paul get this word of the Lord? Question two, what in the following verses constitutes the word of the Lord? And question three, what is the significance of Paul citing the word of the Lord? So question one, where did Paul get this word of the Lord? Well, there are a number of possibilities. It could be an agraphon. In Greek, that means something that is a, not graphon, not written down. In other words, there were other sayings of Jesus, in addition to other deeds of Jesus, but other sayings of Jesus that weren't recorded or made it down into the Gospels. And that's not surprising because John himself says that the books of this world, right, uh, couldn't contain all the things that Jesus said and uh, did. And so it may be that this is some unknown saying of Jesus. Well, it would have been known to Paul, right, and to many in the early church, but it's unknown to us because it didn't make it into the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Another option is, is that Paul sees himself as following in the line of the Old Testament prophets. The Old Testament prophets regularly said, oh, we have a word of the Lord. And so now Paul, some would argue, sees himself as a prophet who can then speak a word of the Lord. So in other words, this is actually Paul's 
words, but they're authorized by his status as a spokesperson, a prophet of the Lord, not now the God of the Old Testament, but the Lord Jesus Christ, as the term for Lord of the Old Testament God is applied to Jesus. A third possibility is that Paul is kind of summarizing, in his own words, the teachings of Jesus. So the idea would be that Paul just knows all the teachings of Jesus, and he kind of reflects back, and then he, in his own words, summarizes those teachings, especially those teachings having to do with the second coming and how that might be relevant for the Thessalonians. Well, there are different scholars who argue for these different positions. I think the best answer is that Paul is paraphrasing. Now, paraphrasing means that you're not citing it word for word, but he's loosely citing the teachings of Jesus that are found in the Gospels, and the best candidate would be from Matthew 24. Seyun Kim is one New Testament scholar who says this, and he's talking about our passage uh, in, in 1 Thessalonians 4. He says, The several and clear echoes of Jesus saying in the passage, our passage, seem to suggest that Paul must be conscious of the material he is using as Jesus' material, and therefore that the word of the Lord here, Paul is referring to the words of the historical Jesus. That's question one. Question two is, what in the following verses constitutes the word of the Lord? In other words, if you have a red letter Bible, what in the following verses should be in red letters? By the way, um, red letter Bibles really aren't the best thing, right? Because somehow they suggest the idea that red letters are more important than the black letters. And of course, that's not true, right? And so one has to be a little bit careful about distinguishing the words of Jesus red letters from the other words of the Bible. We don't want a canon within a canon. But anyway, if you had that mentality, you might say again to yourself, what in the following verses I need to put in red letters? What in the following verses actually is the word of the Lord that Paul is citing? And uh, it's not 100% clear here how to answer this question, but the best answer, I think, is this. Verse 15b, Paul, so to say, summarizes or gives the upshot of the word of the Lord. And it's interesting what his upshot is. We will emphatically, certainly not, we will absolutely not, we will definitely not precede those who have fallen asleep. Remember the pastoral Paul who is speaking Remember how Paul is trying to comfort grieving Christians over those who have fallen asleep. And he's stressing that, they will, that, that we who are living will not be at an advantage. Or the other way around, those who have died will not be at a disadvantage. Anyway, after Paul first summarizing or giving the upshot of Paul, of Jesus' teaching, then he loosely cites or paraphrases the word of the Lord in verses 16 in the first half of 17a. And then in verse 17b, he adds the pastoral conclusion. He simply says, and so we will be with the Lord forever. We, that is, we who are living and we who have already died, all Christians, living and deceased, or living and resurrected and transformed, will enjoy the personal presence of the Lord Jesus Christ? That's question two. But actually, it's question three, I think, that is the most important one to ask, and that is, what is the significance of Paul citing the word of the Lord? What does Paul gain by quoting from Jesus or appealing to Jesus' words? And maybe the answer is clear to you, and the answer is this, it adds weight to Paul's words. It adds authority to his argument. I mean, Paul doesn't do what we often do today. He doesn't say something like, I just feel. Or he doesn't say, it just seems to me. No, Paul says, um, I have an authoritative teaching that goes back to the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Do you see how powerful that would be? One scholar comments, I think appropriately so, on that on the rhetorical effect of Paul citing the word of the Lord. He says, By placing his assurance that the living would not have precedence over the dead at the coming of the Lord, under the rubric of a word of the Lord, Paul what? Paul attributed the highest possible authority to his assertion in verse 15b. If you remember what we said earlier under the literary, under the map quest, under the argumentation of Paul, remember the first ground was a weighty word of the church. 
And now if Paul, the second ground, he appeals to the word of the Lord, you can see now why we could call it a weighty word of the Lord. Again, Paul doesn't just offer his personal opinion. He offers an authoritative, weighty teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, we finish yet another of our hermeneutical categories, the historical approach to the text. And we turn to the fourth, or if you want better, the fifth one, which we call theological. And theological involves a number of things. It involves looking at how our passage, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18, fits within the rest of Paul's thinking or theology or the rest of the New Testament or the rest of the whole scriptures. And it also involves clearly hearing the theos, that is, hearing the voice of God in the text. So here's one important question that we need to ask that I think should be qualified under the category theological. And that is the claim that Paul makes in the opening assertion that you may not grieve like the rest. That you may not grieve like the rest. Now, if you look at those words and you take it kind of naively or literally, and and some people do, you might say, well, wait a minute. Paul is saying that the Christians in Thessaloniki should not grieve. Even in the context of death, grieving or crying is inappropriate for followers of Jesus Christ. And this qualifies as a theological issue because I want to say, now, now, wait a minute, is that true? And how does that compare to what Paul and the rest of the biblical writers say? Is it true when I look at the rest of scriptures, how should Christians react to the problem of death? And then more specifically, is it appropriate for Christians to grieve or to cry in the face of death? Now, this is a wrong view in my opinion, but there are just a few scholars who say, yes, this is what Paul is saying, that there are no tears allowed. We had that old song, big girls don't cry. Well, it'd be in a sense, big Christians don't cry, right? Mature believers, you know, there's no grieving for them, even in the context of death. Abraham Mallerby, for example, says, Paul's attitude toward this grief, grief over the loss, over over, over the the death of uh, loved ones, is equally straightforward. It is prohibited. That is, it, grieving, is prohibited. Paul is thus making an absolute prohibition. And it's not only uh, a few commentators who think that this is what Paul is saying. I'm afraid that there are many more Christians today who also believe that this is what Paul is saying. This is the idea that many Christians have that they should not grieve in the context of death. Uh, I'm thinking of uh, a situation uh, that is a personal one to me. It involved my cousin who died at an all too early age. She was 32, so she was a mother of three young children. And in less than a month, she went from diagnosis to death. Less than a month from diagnosis to death. Anyway, I went to the funeral service and Uh, Even though the death was quick, um, she and her family had some time to think about the service and they wanted to sing and we did sing a hymn that maybe you know, it's, we bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. Now, remember the context. It was difficult to sing that song then. In fact, I think it was inappropriate to sing that song then. But I understand what they were trying to say. They were trying to say, wait a minute, even in the context of death, there is a victory that the scriptures speak about. And we want to claim that victory. Even in this funeral service, we want to affirm the victory over death and the reason for praise that we as Christians have. I think that's what they were trying to accomplish. And I think they were wanting to do that because... They maybe didn't think about it all out loud or so consciously, but I think there was within them the sense that, wait a minute, Christians don't grieve in the context of death. That if you do, that somehow you're a weak Christian, you know, that a mature believer in the faith would have enough faith, would have enough confidence in the promises of God's word that grieving is not permitted or it isn't appropriate. 
But I want to suggest to you that that is an unbiblical and also an unpastoral, but it first and foremost is an unbiblical position. Look at what Paul himself says. That Paul expects Christians to grieve, let alone in death, but also in other situations, is clear from some of his texts. Philippians 2, 27, he says, If Epaphroditus had died from his illness... Now, who is Epaphroditus? Oh, he's the helper from the Philippian church. The Philippians sent Paul, when, when, when he wrote to them, he was in prison, likely in Rome, and they sent him not only money, but they also sent him somebody to help him. His name was Epaphroditus. Anyway, Epaphroditus got ill and almost died, and Paul said, if he had died, I would have had, Paul said, sorrow upon sorrow. Paul would have grieved the death of Epaphroditus. Or writing to the Romans, Paul says, rejoice with those who rejoice, but he also says, weep with those who weep. Paul envisions the very real and appropriate response that in the context of pain and suffering, Christians are going to cry, they're going to weep. And how does Paul refer to death in 1 Corinthians 15, the great resurrection chapter? Well, there he says it's the last what? It's the last enemy. So don't make the mistake of thinking that somehow death is a friend of Christians. No, it is an enemy. And the rest of Scripture is quite clear about that too. God created us not to die, but to live. Death is really a consequence of the fall, human sin and rebellion against God. And you perhaps are already thinking about the example of Jesus, a powerful example. How did Jesus respond to the death of his friend Lazarus? And we have that very short, it's the shortest verse in the whole Bible, don't overstate that, but that short phrase, Jesus wept. Jesus wept. And it's interesting to notice how the crowd reacted. In John 11, where that text occurs, it says, Jesus wept. And then the next verse says, so the Jews said, see how he loved him. The Jews didn't say, oh, Jesus has weak faith. Well, no, no. Right? Uh, no, they, they didn't say, oh, Jesus is a poor believer or something like that. No, see how he loved him. And so I want you to hear me say this. I'm going to say it twice because I believe it's very important. Tears in the face of death is not a sign of weak faith, but of great love. I'm going to say it again. Tears in the face of death is not a sign of weak faith, but of great love. When you cry, when someone nearby you dies, it doesn't mean that you have weak faith. It doesn't mean that you're a poor believer. It just means that you really, really love this person. That means that the enemy has struck. Yes, there is victory over death. Yes, there is a hope that Paul talks about. But don't confuse that victory and that hope as grounds for concluding that Christians don't grieve. So, what is the difference then between Christians and non-Christians in the context of death? It isn't one of grieving, right? Christians will grieve, Christians will shed tears in the context of death just as much as non-Christians will. But there is an important difference, and that's the assertion that Paul makes in verse 13. That's the, the key teaching of this whole passage. We grieve with hope. Even through our tears, there is a hope that Christians embrace and that Paul grounds in our passage. And we're going to have to think more about that uh, as uh, as we preach and we teach this kind of passage. Well, that's an important first theological point. What is a biblical view of death and a biblical view of grieving? And how do Christians differ from non-Christians in the context of death? But uh, there are a couple of other things that we can talk about, and that is the logic of verse 14. The logic of verse 14. If you look at the two halves of verse 14, it may not be so clear to you how Paul got from the first half of the verse to the second half of the verse. The first half of the verse is, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and remember the grammatical part, if we believe and we do that Jesus died and rose again, How does it get to the second half? So God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. The idea that deceased Christians will be alive and will be with Jesus when he comes again in glory. In other words, they won't be at a disadvantage. How do you get from the first part of the verse to the second part of the verse? Well, there's a missing middle step there that Paul assumes. 
Well, I, I know that Paul assumes it because I can see that assumption in his other writings. When I look at Paul's other writings, when I compare our passage with Paul's other letters, that's part of a theological approach, interpreting scripture with scripture and Paul with Paul, we can see what that missing or middle step is. And that has to do with the resurrection of Jesus. In Paul's mind, the resurrection of Jesus is intimately linked with the resurrection of believers, of Christians. You got one, you got the other. You don't have one, you don't have the other. They always go together. You can see that in a lot of texts. Romans 8, for example. Paul says, And if the Spirit of Him, that is of God, who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who lives in you. So again, Paul first refers in the first part of the verse to God raising Jesus Christ, the resurrection of Jesus, and how that's linked to the resurrection of Christians. Again, another example, 1 Corinthians 6, 14. By his power, God raised the Lord Jesus from the dead, and he will raise us also from the dead. Well, that's pretty clear. So God raised Jesus, and Jesus' resurrection is intimately linked in Paul's thinking or his theology to believers' resurrection. 2 Corinthians 4.14 Because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus. Another intimate link. Same breath, same verse. The resurrection of Jesus linked with the resurrection of believers. Colossians 1 verse 18 Jesus is the firstborn from among the dead. And then the best chapter of all for the resurrection in the scriptures, 1 Corinthians 15. But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? Right. So there you have the negative. If Christ hasn't been raised, well then believers won't be raised. But of course Paul can't stop there and he has the positive and it's throughout the passage. It was a little long for me to cite here. But he says, for as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. And because there is this intimate connection between Jesus' resurrection and believers' resurrection, Paul can refer to the resurrection of Jesus as what? The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Now, uh, maybe we don't appreciate the first fruits metaphor because we're not farmers or we're not gardeners. What is a first fruit? Well, it's the first ear of grain to ripen, or it's the first grape on the vine to ripen. And why do farmers typically get excited about the first fruits? Well, they know as real as that grain is in their hand, or as real as that grape is that they can pop into their mouth, that's how real the rest of the harvest will surely be. And Paul now is doing the same thing for Jesus' resurrection. Paul says that Jesus' resurrection is a first fruit of our resurrection. As real as we believe Jesus rose from the grave, that's how real we can believe our deceased loved ones will rise from the grave. And wait a minute. If they're going to rise from the grave, that means they'll be alive when Jesus comes again. And if they're alive when Jesus comes again, then they won't miss out. They won't be at a disadvantage. They will share equally with us who are still alive when Jesus comes again. So in other words, Paul's logic is quite clear, right? Uh, he obviously had preached this to the Thessalonians, and therefore he doesn't need to spell it out for them. But again, we can see from his theology, from looking at his other letters, how Paul thinks or theologizes and he can briefly go in verse 14a to the reality of Jesus' resurrection, to the end part of verse 14b, to the reality of deceased believers' resurrection. And he does so in this context because he wants to reassure the Christians in Thessaloniki, don't worry about your deceased loved ones. Don't worry about those guys who have fallen asleep. They're going to become alive. And 1 Corinthians 15 says they will be changed in the twinkling of an eye. And then all Christians... We who are living and those who have been resurrected and transformed will share and experience fully the glory of Jesus' return. Well, we've come to the end of our five hermeneutical principles, but there's one more important topic to talk about, and that is the rapture. But we're going to bring our discussion now to a close, and I invite you to turn to the next video where we take up this important exegetical, theological, and pastoral subject.